Hey fearsome friends, it's me again Miss Fearsome, back with more stories to creep you out, and I think these will do the job just fine. So sit back, relax, and get cosy comfy warm, because it's time to let your nightmares in. This happened seven years ago, but I still remember the fear I felt like it was yesterday. When I was in my early twenties, I worked the night shift at a bakery, making the donuts, and three nights of the week I would be with my co-worker, and two nights I would be working alone. I loved it. So it was summertime and we were having some problems with the AC. So the maintenance guy Andy came during the night shift when I was working to fix it. The bakery was small and crowded during the day, so it was the best time for him to come when it was empty. Management always let me know when Andy would be there, so it was never a surprise, and at first he was very pleasant. I had no issues sharing the space with him as we worked. However, one evening this all changed. My one co-worker was a little late, as she said she'd lost track of time in the shower. So Andy piped up and said, laughing, We should all shower together to save time. It was creepy as hell. I'd stated during the night that I lived alone, and his response was, Good, I can have you to myself then. After that night, I'd realised Andy wasn't the kind of guy I thought he was, so I stopped speaking to him unless I had to. And before long, the AC was repaired, and I thought I was finally free of him. Fast forward to one night a few weeks later when I was working alone, and it was two o'clock in the morning. I was trying donuts when all of a sudden I heard a loud banging on the front window. Startled, I looked up, and Andy was there. He was calling my name and asking to be let in, but no one had told me anything about him coming. He then began to pull on the front door handles, but luckily it was locked. I ran into a corner of the bakery where he couldn't see me and tried calling my manager, but with no response. The phone started ringing then, and I could see the caller ID from where I was sitting. It was Andy. He relentlessly banged on the window and tried to pry open the door. My fear rising, I dialed 911. The cops thankfully arrived within 10 minutes and searched Andy's vehicle. In the back seat, they found duct tape, a knife, and rope. But they couldn't do anything because he didn't harm me, and Andy told the police that he was just there to fix the AC. My manager called me back in the morning, telling me the AC was working fine and they'd never asked Andy to come. So whatever you had planned for me, Andy, I'm glad I never found out. When I was a child, my mum worked as a teacher and she was very close to a co-worker of hers who had a son around my age, who I was very close to. When my mum or her friend would head out on a night, the other would take care of both of us kids, which basically meant I spent half my time over there, and my friend spent half his time at my house, which was fun for us. We lived in different cities, but since that system had been going on pretty much forever, I grew up knowing my friend's city just as well as mine. His mum was well aware of that, so that being said, whenever we were going on a walk in their area, she'd let us wander around because she knew we'd always find our way back to her. My mum though was more cautious and always kept an eye on us, walking behind us to make sure she'd always be able to see us. I just wish her friend would have done the same. One day, when I was around six or seven, we were on a walk with my friend Marcus and his mum Katie. It was a very sunny day, and I was wearing a dress that had embroidered flowers on it, and my blonde long hair was down around my shoulders. I often heard I was a pretty kid, even from strangers in the street, and besides making my parents and I somewhat uncomfortable, nothing bad had ever happened. However, during the walk that day, Katie was ahead of us, and I was chatting and fooling around with Marcus, when he suddenly remembered something urgent he had to tell his mum as urgent as something can be for an eight-year-old boy. So he ran up to her and left me strolling behind for a couple of minutes. We were circling around a big camping site, 
and were walking by the white vans and camping cars, when I noticed that one of the vans had its back doors open, where a man, probably in his forties, was smoking a cigarette and leaning against the vehicle. He locked eyes with me as I was approaching, then saw that Katie and Marcus weren't paying much attention as they were already a couple of metres ahead. The man then proceeded to pull me by my arm close to him, so I found myself with my body touching his. Weirded out, I didn't even say a word, although I knew Katie would have heard me if I'd called for help. He leaned in towards me and was obviously much taller than me. Then he muttered something I didn't get and winked at me, kissing me on the lips, then pulling me to the open doors of his van. At this point, if he'd pushed me just a little bit, I would have fallen directly into the truck. At this point, I just was too scared to even lift a finger, and even though I didn't understand everything that was going on, I knew it wasn't okay. He put his hands on the doors as to close them, and I felt my heart sink. Just then, another man jogged towards us, looking to be in his forties as well, and he was waving hello to me, saying something along the lines of, I lost sight of you for a bit. I was so, so scared. He had a very friendly look on his face and was staring at me with great insistence and a huge reassuring smile. The van man awkwardly laughed and yanked me out of the way of the van, slamming the door shut. Then I ran to Katie as I heard the van drive away, the guy acting like nothing had just happened. To this day I've not told that story to anyone. Not to Katie, Marcus, my mum, and I'm 22 years old now. So to the friendly guy who obviously didn't lose sight of me, and probably saw what was going on, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. To the paedophile who surely would have kidnapped me, and who was strangely okay with kissing a kid in public, and in broad daylight, I wish you hell. So after crying a little bit after looking at crime scenes on the internet, I think it might be time to tell this story. It's just one of those moments when I randomly start thinking about it in a more serious mood than usual. It happened about four months ago, maybe more, but I really don't know for sure, and I was 19 years old. I'm 20 now and was going home from university after classes. I usually take my keys with me, but around that time I'd lost them, and my mum was yet to take me and get a new set. I remember I kept insisting, but she wouldn't listen. So what I did was knock on the door to get my younger brother's attention so he'd come and let me in. But my mum also took his keys and just left him there locked up in the house. One day I asked my brother to get my charger from my room, then I called one of my aunts to see if I could go hang out with her at her workplace. She said yes, but told me to call an Uber and she'd pay the driver as soon as I got there. So I did just that. Now the Uber didn't pick me up exactly at home. It was at the house across the street instead. There's no particular reason for this. It's just what happened. But the moment I saw the guy, he gave me a weird vibe. I also tend to be paranoid every time I so much as hop in a taxi. So I just got in, rolled down the window and kept a grip on both of my phones. It was all relatively normal, until we got to the area where my aunt's workplace was, which was a convenience store, and he just completely drove past it, claiming he was just following the GPS. He wouldn't let me see the GPS though, and seemed to know exactly where he was going. But I was feeling kind of doomed, because I don't know directions, and I could only rely on the driver being a decent person. But wherever he was taking me, I had no idea. I remember seeing a fountain that I'd recognised from whenever my mum drove to my uncle's place, but that was a far way away from my aunt's place. By now I was trying to think of what to do, because we were driving past a ton of empty housing, and a couple of them even seemed to be still under construction. But then suddenly he stopped, and we were somewhere that looked like the end of civilization, literally on a hill. Then he turned off the engine. Looking back, I got lucky in so many ways. Now my phone had no credit, and as soon as I'd remembered that, my aunt called and asked me where I was. I literally felt my heart drop, because I had no idea, 
and this dude was just staring at me. I said I didn't know and asked him, Hey, where have you taken me? I wouldn't know what to tell you, kid, he replied. That was enough for me, and I grabbed my backpack, opened the door with a loud, That's fine, I'll see myself out. And I hauled ass like I hadn't in a very long time. I remember even being afraid of putting my backpack on my back, just in case he'd chase me and pull on it. So I was holding it in my hand with my hoodie wrapped around my waist as I thought of where I was able to hide. I thought of knocking on someone's door for help, but for some reason that didn't seem that safe either. I remember telling my aunt not to hang up because he was still following me in the car. Just then, I noticed an empty barren, surrounded by concrete walls and a strong bar gate, and there was enough space under the gate to crawl through. So I literally threw my backpack over, then crawled underneath. There was a huge electrical control box, so I opened it to crouch inside and hide, my aunt still on the phone with me. She, my other aunt and my uncle were all on a call with each other, putting credit on my phone and asking for my live location through WhatsApp because I had absolutely no idea where I was, literally in the middle of nowhere. I waited there for about two hours, and this guy was there the whole time. I even had a pee outside the box, immediately running back inside to assume my hiding position. There were even tiny spiders and old honeycombs, so I was also fighting both my arachnophobia and trypophobia. At some point, I'm guessing the guy left when my uncle arrived in his truck. He obviously couldn't see where I was, so he kept honking and told me to let him know when I could hear it. I finally did and got out of the box, and for a while I thought that maybe this had been one big misunderstanding, and I'd just jumped out of some guy's car like a maniac without even paying him. But then when I got home, after staying at my aunt's place for a while, I checked the Uber app, and not only did it say I had already paid, but it also said I made it to my destination so I ruled that out. I had told my aunts not to tell my mum about it because she would go insane for the minor inconvenience, and telling her would only freak her, which would also be no help at all. But eventually I did tell her, so she would finally get me a copy of that key, because of course something bad had to have happened until she actually listened to me, plus nowadays she'll always put credit on my phone. When I look back on it now, I was more angry than scared. I could have been one of the many, many girls who just disappeared, then were later found dead on a random hill or in a ditch. I can't say that I suffer survivor's guilt, because in all honesty I don't. But I can't help but think that could have been me, whenever another kid or teenager is on the news as missing or found dead. It really could have gone terribly wrong, and my parents believe this guy was a rookie who'd maybe felt sorry for me so let me go, because if he had wanted to, he could have hurt me or just tried to kill me right then and there. I don't even know anymore. I sent his Uber profile to all the girls I know so that if they ever happen to get him as their driver, they can cancel it. I don't take Ubers anymore. I, a 40-year-old female, went to the university at Buffalo, fresh out of high school in the early 2000s. At that time, the online world was a bit like the Wild West, which included having to do quite a bit more digging to find specific information than today's split-second Google search. As such, it was a much easier time for colleges and universities to hide or spin campus crime statistics to make themselves look better for prospective wallets. I mean, students. Case in point, I was at orientation a month or two before my freshman year, and one of the mass presentations I had to attend was about campus safety. Bright-faced, upperclassmen orientation aides enthusiastically, verbally fellated the school, boasting about how North Campus was in, at the time, the safest town in the country, Amherst, New York, and that the only murder in recent history had occurred nine years ago, to an unfortunate student named Linda Yalem who was murdered on the campus's bike path during a lone early morning run. It was a fate that we were assured could be avoided by simply not hitting the bike path alone. 
What they conveniently didn't reveal was that A, the killer hadn't been caught, and B, Yalom wasn't his only victim. He was a serial rapist, and eventually serial killer, who had already been active in the area for at least 25 years in downtown Buffalo, and on the secluded bike paths of the Buffalo suburbs. In retrospect, had this information been as readily accessible as it is now, it probably would have kept me from the most bone-chilling encounter of my life. Fast forward three years. I was a very depressed 20-year-old who was struggling with her sexual identity, and her parents' reaction to it in a much less accepting time than now. I'd left school, and to avoid being home, shacked up with a woman who promised me the world, but then rejected me in favour of her ex-girlfriend on the night I moved in, and eventually turned out to be a felon who drained vulnerable would-be love interests' bank accounts, though that's a very convoluted story for another time. So clearly I was an unhappy young adult, desperate for love and a sense of belonging, sometimes to my own detriment. Despite my roommate's many unkind and hurtful gestures, I stuck with it in the naive hope that she would eventually come around and fulfil her pie-in-the-sky promises to me. On a particular July night, that hope just fell flat. I was at Roxy's Green Room, a now-defunct lesbian bar and club that many wayward Buffalo lesbians, myself included, flocked to at night to feel a much-needed sense of community and to hopefully land a special someone. Since the latter just wasn't happening for me, and since I didn't yet know what kind of person she really was, I was still stuck on my roommate. She liked to dangle emotional carrots overhead, out of some sick joy that she got from making me hurt, but also hang on to hope. And after a promise to hit Roxy's alone with me and talk about us, she showed up with her ex turned current and shut me out. I was wounded and upset enough to leave around 1am, well before the 4am last call that I was still young and spry enough to stomach, and without a ride home like my usually wiser self would have secured. While my apartment on Delaware was walking distance from Roxy's, it was a good half-hour walk. Being as emotionally charged as I was, though, I angrily hoofed it down the main street sidewalk, still managing to follow the pedestrian rule of walking against traffic, despite stupidly ignoring a rule I knew well from years of watching forensic shows. If you're a woman, never leave a bar at night alone, especially if you're walking. I got exactly halfway home when a dark green sedan started driving towards me. I thought nothing of it, until the car slowed down near me as I walked. A lone middle-aged man was in the car with a skin tone that I originally associated with the guy being Italian, but in retrospect, he could have easily been Puerto Rican. He had dark hair, and most importantly, almost impossibly dark eyes that seemed to hold no light of good intentions. Now, I was used to guys being pigs. I'd been catcalled by downtown construction workers when an ex-girlfriend and I shared a kiss, and I had endured all matter of wholly unwanted, graphic and ham-fisted advances from dudes at school. And although I'd never take the stance that I was asking for it, I was young and thin, so I was dressed in a tight, red crop top with flare-legged black spandex pants. The get-up was meant to turn women's heads, so I wasn't exactly surprised that I caught the attention of the wrong sex. I paid little attention to it, never mind past mild irritation that a guy old enough to be my dad would look at me like that as the guy drove off and turned at the next intersection behind me. My walk resumed. I put the guy out of my mind and I continued my trek, but the peace didn't last. About two or three minutes later, I saw a familiar green car coming up on me again. This time, the guy's window was down a bit, and he shouted, Hey! in a beckoning manner, and gestured in a way that made me wonder if he thought I was a lady of the night. Now that incensed me. Despite my recent struggles with my identity and the resulting entropy in my life, I was always a good kid. I flashed him a quick, annoyed look to inform him that despite the mildly revealing clothing, he was barking up the wrong tree for several reasons and then I ignored him, focusing forward. He sped off again and turned again. At that point, it was clear that the dude was casing me like a cat burglar cases a house. It was before the time of Uber, or even widespread use of cell phones. 
and with no cabs passing by, I had little hope of getting one. Public transit existed, but it was both sparse and not running nearby. The stretches of Maine between intersections were long, and I'd probably be spotted on them anyway since the guy was circling. Being 15 minutes away from both Roxy's and my home, there was also no way I could get anywhere near either place before the green car came back around again. I quickly thumbed through my mental rolodex of true crime show-inspired safety tips that should have kept me out of this situation in the first place. Tip 1. Get to an open business, inform the clerk, have him or her call the police and stay put. Then the guy would either give up or get caught. I was coming up on the convenience store on the opposite side of the street where I'd bought a pack of cigarettes earlier in the night. But as I got closer, the desolate blackness through the windows told me that it was closed. I looked around for something else. Another bar, a gas station, anything. But the street was flanked by shuttered brick buildings and a locked up church. Then came the headlights and green again. Again the guy slowed down as he approached me, but his demeanour had shifted again. He put his palm out impatiently, as if he couldn't understand my lack of complicity. Come on, the guy yelled through his now open window, his face an equal picture of aggression, intimidation and frustration. I kept out of arm's reach on the sidewalk and once again ignored him, but this time I was properly shaken. He angrily punched the gas and was off on his familiar circuit back around to me. Now I knew I was in trouble. The guy's behaviour was escalating and I was genuinely scared that his next move would be to grab me off the sidewalk and pull me into his car. From there, God only knew what sort of depravity I was in for. I scrambled through my memory for another safety tip and I remembered that making myself both impossible to ignore and obviously in distress could get me some much needed attention from an outside party. I ran into the middle of Main Street and started frantically waving my hands and shouting at every car that was coming my way. The first car drove by. The second car drove by. The terror in me was palpable. I knew the stories of city dwellers like Kitty Genovese, who were left to their horrible fates at the hands of monsters by jaded throngs of people who heard the attacks perpetrated on them and their cries for help but did nothing out of both of an assumption that someone else would step up and a reluctance to get involved. Would I be the next victim of the bystander effect, snatched away to an early end because of big city indifference? As I was beginning to lose hope, but still determined to keep trying while thinking of my next bold move, a van pulled over that had four black guys in it. As a white woman I was relieved. I knew that statistically male predators overwhelmingly tend to prey on women of the same race. In a game of numbers this van full of guys was exponentially safer than that single stalker in the green car. I opted to take the gamble. I frantically told them about the man in the green car who kept circling around the block and following me, and begged for a ride home. The driver asked if I had any money in exchange for the favour. I didn't. Then he asked if I had any cigarettes. I may be one of the only people you'll ever meet who actually had her life saved by smokes. Though I had never been a smoker before, I briefly picked up the filthy habit because New York State bars still allowed smoking and it was a weird part of Buffalo lesbian bar culture that I emulated to fit in. Yet another way that I was, as are many, kind of an idiot in my early twenties. Yes, I answered urgently. I just bought a pack and you can have the whole thing if you'll get me home. Admittedly, I was initially a little miffed that the driver wanted something from me in exchange for not letting me get abducted off the street, as well as the implication that he might not have helped me if I had nothing. Still, I had the Marlboros. He had a vehicle and the stars had hopefully aligned. Regardless of how it went down, I had help if he let me in, and the details didn't matter. After a second two of thought, which seemed like an eternity to me, the driver agreed and one of the two dudes in the back opened the side door for me and got out so I could slide in into the seat behind the driver. As the door to my safe carriage full of impromptu nights shut, and I got buckled in, I looked out my window just in time to see the green car creeping past the van and proving to my saviours that I was telling a very disturbing true story. Until my dying day, I will never forget the man's eyes. 
Feeling safe, surrounded by a closed van full of young, tough-looking rescuers, I looked that bastard dead in the eyes. Part of me was rightfully terrified, but another part of me wanted to look right at him defiantly and tell him with my eyes, I got away from you. I win. I was repaid with the most evil, hateful look that I've ever had directed at me, let alone seen. His eyes were black, black like a cat's eyes when it sees a bug in the house and its hunting instincts cause its pupils to blow to allow more light in. But at least there's usually a hint of playful mischief in a hunting cat's eyes. The eyes I was seeing were those of pure, unadulterated predator, and the vitriol that practically oozed from them as he glared at me let me know exactly how he felt about his prey, having the audacity to elude him. He drove off into the night, and so did we, in a bit less direct route to make sure that we lost him. After a blessedly quick jaunt with frequent looks behind my shoulder, I was delivered home, one pack of cigarettes short, but alive and in one piece. The first thing I did when I got in the door was to check the locks on absolutely everything. After that, the adrenaline started to wear off and the pure fear set in. I was so terrified that the man in the green sedan was searching the area where I got dropped off that I grabbed the cordless phone, then lay completely flat on the living room floor for hours to keep totally out of sight from any of my apartment windows. As I lay there, I called the Buffalo police and relayed my terrifying tale in as much detail as I could give them. Being painfully aware of the prevalence of hate crimes against the LGBT community at the time, I told the cops that it was possible that the man was cruising near Roxy's to prey on vulnerable queer women who were out and about. In hindsight, I think the guy just saw who he thought was an easy mark out by herself and availed himself of the opportunity to strike. Fast forward another four years and I'd moved out of Chicago to live with my then girlfriend. For about half of my four years there, I was pretty homesick. I'd never lived anywhere except my home state of New York, and I went there knowing no one except my ex, who wasn't exactly an empathetic soul, adding to my feelings of isolation. I coped by keeping up on upstate New York news so I'd feel a little less far away. On a chilly mid-January morning in 2007, I was at our computer looking up headlines from my home state when one from WBFO popped up that immediately snared my attention. Bike Path Rapist is Arrested By then, I knew the moniker well. The internet had since aged into a beautifully organised repository of sometimes knowledge, and despite the lack of transparency from my alma mater, I became familiar with the Buffalo area mystery man and his active status throughout my time in Buffalo. Now I had a name for the spectre responsible for that bit of eeriness that was always in the back of my mind when I was a student. The bike path rapist was revealed as Altemio Sanchez, a middle-aged native of Puerto Rico, who coached his son's sports teams and was affectionately referred to as Uncle Al in his neighbourhood. As with many other killers, his disguises were his community, involvement, and just being ordinary. The man was estimated to have been responsible for 19 to 15 rapes around the Buffalo area since 1975 and had confessed to three murders, the Yalim murder in 91, a second in 92, and a third which had occurred only three and a half months prior to his capture. I don't know if you've ever felt your heart somehow get wedged up into your voice box and get dropped into the depths of your stomach simultaneously, but believe me when I say that it's possible, given the right catalyst. For me, that catalyst was the printed proof that the man was active while I lived in Buffalo and frequented Roxy's. More so, I knew that serial killers rarely take breaks as lengthy as the one between his 92 and 2006 killings. He had to have had at least been attempting to sate his evil impulses for those 14 years. That realisation gave me a very, very bad feeling that I'd crossed paths with someone much more dangerous than I'd realised. The news article had no picture of Sanchez, but this sickening feeling in me prodded me to find one. It was almost as if I knew what I would see before I ever even looked at him. A Yahoo searched his name, because that was still a respectful means of finding things on the internet in 2007, and I was horrified, though not surprised, to see those same black soulless predatory eyes that I looked into four times on that summer night in Buffalo in 2003. 
The timeline fit. My profile as a victim fit if he did, in fact, mistake me for a downtown prostitute. And barring all else, I knew those eyes. I had a potentially deadly close encounter with Altemio Sanchez, the bike path rapist, aka the bike path killer. My lack of sense put me in his orbit, and a van of angels pulled me out of it. I know who I saw, and as God is my witness, I will never be convinced otherwise. Though many of the rapes fell victims to statutes of limitation, Altemio Sanchez pled guilty to the three murders and was sentenced to 75 years to life in prison. In essence, the guy won't be exposed to the outside again, unless he's in a body bag. I have been clean from all drugs since 2019. It took me a while to write this as I never thought I would be posting, because of how stupid I was. I know I will get a lot of negative comments on here, so just don't even say it because I already know. I'm telling this story to remind people that everyone's intentions are not what they seem. I am mentally traumatized from this experience, and I get reminders of it every day. I'm grateful to be alive, and I have no idea what would have happened if I hadn't gotten away when I did. So save the rude and cruel comments, thanks. It was September 2017, I believe, and I was doing whatever I could to survive in this harsh world, so please no judgement. I was on the streets with no family and trapped in an active crack soon to be meth addiction. A bit of backstory. I started using crack in 2015 and figured out that if I sold my body I could make easy money. I know, not ideal. But I was deep in addiction, and at that point I didn't care about anything. But in January 2017, I met Ty, who also smoked crack but worked every day, so I no longer had to sell my body. I was going on about eight months free from it, and also when I'd met Ty, he had a place, as he was doing a lot of work for people in the city. However, I was left on the street by him, the man I thought I had loved. I must have said something wrong, because he flipped out and left with everything I owned in his truck. We'd just spent days getting high, and I was sure he was just throwing a fit. So I went over to my friend, let's call him E's house. It was my home away from home and I felt safe there. E was an older, maybe 60 year old man who liked to get high, and over time he became one of my best friends. One day after I was able to take a shower and put on clean clothes, I remember sitting on the couch in disbelief that Ty could have left me the way he did. I started to cry and wished things had been different, and E held me and comforted me. I knew deep down that I needed a fresh start, to be able to depend on myself and live a happy life. Across the street from E's house was a hometown bar where rappers and musicians would perform. And on that particular night, the bar had been filled with people from the bigger city that was about a half an hour away. Now just to explain, where I come from there isn't really a place for addicts to go and get clean. They do have a women's shelter, which I had been to before, and about 30 minutes away is an even bigger city, where there's all the help you can ask for, if you're willing to work for it, that is. So at this point I was ready to get away from everyone and everything. I had no hope of cleaning up my life if I stayed anywhere close to where I was using, as you have to remove old playmates, playthings and playgrounds, so that's what I needed to do. I went right over to that bar and found a semi-good looking guy heading back to the city I needed to go to. I told him I had planned to go to the shelter in the morning, and he told me I could just go with him. On the ride I remember feeling like a whole hundred bricks had been lifted off my shoulders. I had nothing but the clothes on my back and an Obama phone with no minutes. I asked the guy who was driving me, he had a pretty sweet ride by the way, you don't mess with this right, and I pulled out my crack pipe. He shook his head so I rolled down the window and threw it out. I knew that going into the shelter I had to get better. Not just for me, but I had kids and a family that had at the time still hoped I would get better. I wanted to start over. I just hadn't known at the time how hard that was going to be. 
This random guy who was driving me and I went to a friend of his house and we smoked a blunt. Then I don't remember anything after that. I woke up on the floor of a clean room, and I mean clean as in there was nothing in it, and it smelled like paint. As I looked around I realised that this was the place the dude had been talking about moving into and renting. So I got up and he took me to get a coffee, then he said he would take me to the shelter. I was actually terrified of what I was walking into, having no idea what to expect. All I knew was I needed to better my life, and I needed to do it now. As we drove into downtown I got a little nervous. I knew downtown was full of crime and drug dealers, big buildings and confusing signs, tons of people and traffic, and I then realised I was going to have to work really hard to get my life back together. We pulled onto the street, and before I knew it he was dropping me off. I was standing there in this big, beautiful clean lobby, just feeling lost and broken. I had been with Ty for almost seven months, and this was the first time he'd left me like this, and I was still hurting because of it. I knew he had been seeing someone else during the last month before we broke up, and he didn't hide it. The lobby smelled like lime, and it had spotless white walls. I walked up to the desk, and I was asked if I was homeless, to which I replied yes. She didn't even ask any other questions, just looked at me with sad eyes and said, Okay, hun, let's get you set up. She took me to a small room full of boxes and she handed me one. She explained it was for my personal things, toiletries, etc. Then I looked at her with unsettling eyes and replied that I didn't have any belongings. I had lost everything the night before. So the nice lady gave me some and a pair of leggings. The next was the intake which is where I had to answer a bunch of questions. I was handed a paper with all the rules on it, and at the top of said paper it stated there was no Wi-Fi in or around the building. You'd have to go down to the stop sign to get the internet. My phone was off though, but I could still use Wi-Fi, though at the time I wasn't really that worried about it. I knew Ty was already probably staying with that other girl, Michelle, so I didn't feel it was necessary to even try to use my phone. I decided to cut everyone off, in fact. When she was done giving me the rundown on how things worked, she took me into the day room. Walking from the lobby was weird and I remember feeling sick going through the double doors with stairs off to the left. Under the stairs was a pile of mats and I was told to grab one. I followed her through another set of double doors into the day room which was huge. It was filled with at least 50 females a lot of older ladies with nowhere to go, and it was loud and bright. The wall to my left was full of lockers, which I was told I would get if I stayed there long enough, and in front of that wall was about 10 to 15 round tables, set up where most of the girls were sitting playing cards, colouring and talking. On the other side of the room was the shower bathroom, and a small TV that sat on a wheelable cart. Next to the cart was an end table that had an electrical strip full of chargers and phones, and in the far back right corner was a door that led outside where you could go to smoke. It was nice. There were picnic tables and lawn chairs set up with a huge fenced-in yard for the kids to play in. But when 7pm came around, the whole dynamic of the room changed, and everyone would move around, run in, and then you'd hear it over the speaker. Roll call. We were then instructed to go and get one mat to sleep on as they passed out blankets and pillows to those who were without, and they let us keep the TV on. The first night was scary and lonely. I was in a strange place and not even two full days clean off a week-long crack binge. I was up half of the night with my head just racing, and I finally fell asleep as the other girls started to quieten down. The morning came way too fast, and the rule was you had to get up at 7am. You didn't have to leave, but you did have to get up, and a lot of the older ladies didn't even leave the shelter at all as they knew they had a place to stay there. They had nothing to leave for, so they'd just hang out together at the shelter all day long. I had to go upstairs for breakfast, which was okay. I'm not really a breakfast food person, but that morning I was starving, so I had the whole deal, eggs, bacon and milk. After breakfast, I went out to have a smoke, when I noticed this tiny black girl with cornrows in her hair, and she had some cards in her back pocket. Now I had been playing cards since I was a kid, as my dad taught me a few games. 
I'd played with friends and I also had done some time in jail in the past. I was feeling lonely, didn't know where anything was and it was obvious I needed help. So I asked her her name and if she'd like to play cards with me. She said yes and after two games we'd had a connection. She was cool and she liked me so I was okay with that. I can be awkward around new people and females tend to not like me so I find it hard sometimes to make friends. But she asked me after we'd played a few more games of rummy if I wanted to go to McDonald's with her. I needed to become familiar with the area, so I was cool with that. On the walk there as we were talking, something caught my eye. So I looked up and there he was. It was Ty, driving by with all my belongings in his truck. I tried to call out to him, but he ignored me. I guess he was done with me for good this time. That crushed me. I wanted to fall to the ground and just sink into it. But instead I had about ten different emotions running through my body all at once. I was so angry that he had been looking for a reason to leave me the last month we were together. And when I was staying with my dad, he'd already started seeing this Michelle. I was just absolutely devastated. We continued our walk to McDonald's as I was silent and felt broken. That night was easier to sleep as I was exhausted from not having any sleep the night before. I just felt done and slept like a baby, to be honest. The next day, Mish, my new friend, wanted to show me a place she goes to to get a good free lunch. The only thing was, it was a church and we had to sit through a 30-minute sermon, which was fine with me. We were standing outside waiting on the church to open their doors, when this blacked-out Mercedes-Benz with a trailer hauling a badass Harley pulled up and parked in front of the church. I then heard my loud mouth say, Damn, that's a nice setup. I looked at Mish and then looked back at the Harley, and that's when I saw him. I specifically remember everyone knowing who he was. Will is what they called him. I remember getting excited to meet new people and be a part of a new community, and everyone was really nice going into the church. A guy at the door gave us a pamphlet of meal times and services offered, so I followed Mish to one of the back pews and slid in behind her. The church was pretty with different colours, and a choir singing in a low and almost quiet tone as people around us took their seats. I froze though when Will came in and sat next to me. I looked at Mish, then quickly noticed his gold watch. It could have been fake, but it almost looked like a real Rolex. He was an older black gentleman, talked very smoothly when he introduced himself, with his hand out. I was shocked that he wanted to shake my hand, as no one in my life had done that. So I shook his hand and they were creamy, like he takes very good care of them, obviously not working a physically demanding job. He was nicely dressed and had this pimp hat on like a fedora, it even had a feather in it. His cologne was strong but smelled good, like a man. He was handsome and smooth and was also very confident. Sitting through this sermon I found it hard to pay attention to the preacher, as I remember looking at his clean, shiny black leather shoes, and the socks were black and thick. When the service was finally over, people started heading into the dining area, so I just followed Mish through and we got our food. She picked an empty space to eat at the end of one of the long tables full of chairs, when not even five minutes later, not paying attention to our surroundings as we ate, Will came over and sat three seats away from me. He looked at Mish and said, Do you mind? And I don't know why I didn't see the red flags. Of course I see them now. But looking back, I was so clueless. He hardly said a word the whole time we were eating, and when he was done he got up, threw his stuff away, and I assumed he left after that. Mish and I decided then to go back to the shelter to play some cards and go to the clothes bank she knew about. But as we were walking home and talking, Will pulled up next to us. He rolled down his window and he asked if we needed a ride, but he was looking at me with a deep stare. I looked back at Mish and she refused. Smart girl. But I went with him. Dumb girl. I think I was more curious than anything. I had to know how he made that kind of money and I remember wanting that. We drove around and just talked until my curfew, and I don't know what it was, but I think we had a lot in common, and we related to each other a lot. 
He asked me how I'd ended up at this shelter, and so I told him. I don't know what it was. I'm not sure if I trusted him, but I told him about my past anyway, how I sold my body for drugs and how horrible it was. I said I was glad I didn't do it anymore, and he didn't say much about it, but we agreed that we would continue our talk the next day when he would help me put in a couple of applications. I woke up in the morning to a text from Will that read, What if you made that kind of money but spent it on yourself, not drugs? Everything you make will go to you building your life. Just think about it. I did think about it, and I'm not going to say why I agreed, but I went with the idea that this would work, and I could actually get my life together, and my kids back. Two hundred dollars a half hour. I could be free. I chose to go with him. At that time I think he thought I wanted to be with him, but really I just wanted a way out of the situation I was in. I hated that stinky, loud shelter. He got a room at a motel and we dropped off my stuff, telling me that I needed some new clothes. He told me that he'd just been fired from the truck company he was working as a truck driver at, but he was currently trying to find another job as far as I knew. He took me shopping and got me a few new outfits, more or less outfits to take pictures in to bring in the money. I knew what I was getting into, and I was preparing my mind to handle everything that was about to happen. Will told me that if I went with him, I had to stay clean and have a clear mind to make money and be smart. Looking back, he was so manipulative, making me believe that I would do this to make my life better. I'd already started doing this a few times before I'd become addicted, just to make rent or bills, so I knew I could mentally deal with it but I was still unsure about where this was going, as far as Will was concerned. We got back to the hotel and I did my thing, took pictures and posted them, and it didn't take long before I started to get calls. I did make some money, I kept every penny and Will would take me shopping. I remember the shoes I bought, they were black and gold baby fats. I loved those shoes, and I got about six or seven cute outfits, some makeup and hair dye. Just remember, I came to the shelter with nothing, so being able to get all this stuff made me feel really good. I was confident in myself and hopeful that I could get a place and start a new life within a few weeks, if days like that were to repeat themselves. Remembering how things went, I am starting to think that was part of his game. Making girls think they can do it and keep all the money and then just trap them and make them need you. It's sick. He tricked me made me think I could finally live a clean life. Yeah, I was escorting, but I just treated it like a job. I bought another phone, so I had a new number and used the Obama phone for work and turned it off at 5pm. I thought wrong though. I later that day went back over to the shelter and grabbed the one shirt I had and some personal things I had left with Will. That night was cool. He was really chilled. We talked in separate beds as we got in a two-bed and he hadn't acted like he had interest in me like that, which I was happy about because I didn't want to be with anyone. I just needed a break from emotional attachment. After Ty had left me, I felt like I couldn't trust anyone like that in a long time, again. So I was happy that I was comfy in a bed watching TV, freshly showered and with money in my pocket. I had the best night's sleep and woke up to breakfast, then time to get up and get myself together. He got up early, went and got us breakfast and coffee, ate with me, then left. He said he would be back in a couple of hours, so take my time and do what I had to do. So I did just that. I dyed my hair, the works, and after I was done, I waited for him, when the door opened and a female walked in. She was pale and had a beautiful face, with long pretty blonde hair that ran down her shoulders. She was very petite, actually too skinny but had pretty, big blue eyes that had dark circles under them. It looked like she had been crying, and she was carrying a black trash bag that contained all her possessions. Will walked in behind her and introduced her as Anna, and that she needed some help too. He instructed me to get her together, make her pretty and take some pictures and post them. He then told her to go and take a shower, and then asked to talk to me outside. So we went out and as I was shutting the door, his voice turned very stern as he said, I see you have not made any money yet. Why the hell is that? 
I tried to explain that Sundays were the slowest days, and I would be lucky to make any money. But before I could finish, he cut me off and said, I don't give a fuck. You need to make some fucking money. What, you think this hotel pays for itself? I will pay for it tonight. But from now on, you pay half of all expenses. Now go make some fucking money. I couldn't even believe he was talking to me like this. I'd never seen him so mad. His voice scared the hell out of me. I looked at him when he cut me off, and I could see him getting angry, his eyes getting wide and the whites just disappeared as they became black. I did what he said, then he left me alone with the new girl whilst he went to get food and whatever else he was up to. When Anna had finished her shower, her skin was more exposed as she was wearing a small towel, walking out of the bathroom. I knew she was addictive to IV use. I assumed heroin and she'd confirmed it after I asked if it was going to be a problem not doing drugs, because that was his rule for me. Why wouldn't it be a rule for the other girls? After my kid's father passed away from an overdose, I didn't like to surround myself with girls I knew I could get close to, try to help, then something bad would happen. So I cut all that out. However, when she told me, I was like, okay, no, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to make some calls because you can't stay here. At that point, I didn't even care what the hell Will had to say. I didn't want her here, period. As soon as he came through the door, I stopped him and took him outside, and I told him I didn't think I could work with her, as I didn't want to be around a heroin addict, or any kind of addict for that matter. He did make her pack her toiletries and clothes and took her home, and it felt like he was trying to please me for some reason. Will and I then took a ride to Main Street, where all the girls walk and work, it was so weird. Remember how I said that he knew everyone at the church? Well, he knew all those girls, business owners, police officers, and other men who drove drug dealer cars. I don't know why I just didn't run then, and I never will. About an hour or two of driving around, talking to a bunch of different girls, this random one jumped into the car. It was crazy. They had known each other for years, I assumed, and she had been looking for him and wanted to make some money. She was quite a bit older than me, but still really beautiful. She had long, thick, curly jet black hair, but I didn't really get a look at her until we got back to the hotel. Will told me he wanted to get a few girls together and make some big money, but I was always going to be number one. He told me I was important, and we were building our own family. Amy was tall and thick, but she was gorgeous. Big blue eyes, pretty skin, small waist with a big round butt and she was a straight-up bitch. She took benzos as she was prescribed them, so I guess he allowed it on that occasion. But it wasn't long before I couldn't help but watch her. She was popular, but then at night she would be getting high and nodding off. It drove me crazy. I think I even started a fight with Will about it, telling him it wasn't fair. She can get high, but I can't. It made me so angry. Will would leave me at the hotel during the day to make money, and he would take Amy to the street and worked her there. Well, it wasn't two days until they came home with yet another girl, a young one too at only 18. It was her choice as she had no family, but I only know what they tell me. Her name was Amanda, and she was short like me, though on the chunky side, which was okay. Guys like chunky too. She had blonde long hair and a cute face, and she was sweet not saying much. I tried to get to know her a little better, but she wasn't around for long. I posted her with Amy and she didn't get much feedback as more people were calling for Amy. Amanda stayed with us for a few days before she decided she wanted to go home. Then Will, Amy and I didn't stay at that hotel for long as we ended up going deep into the city, the farthest away from my hometown. It was a bigger room and the hotel was a little nicer, with a view of the whole city. It had a shitty little microwave and a drive-up entrance to your room, and Will and Amy brought home two girls that night. I don't remember them much because I wasn't involved with them often, but I posted them, and the next few days we made money. Every time a girl would make money, they would give it to Will because he had them believe he was saving it for them and getting them anything they wanted. I continued to make money on my own then, and I also gave him money. I got conspicuous with it, though and I will never forget the moment I knew I wasn't safe anymore. I was outside smoking a cigarette, 
and I wasn't there long. But when I came back into the room, Will had all three girls posing on the bed as he was coaching them on how to pose and, t and taking snaps of them. I'd say a word and close the door slowly. I don't know why I felt the way I did, but it just didn't feel right. I don't know if he'd heard me open and close the door, but I heard him yell my name and he said he needed me. He handed me his phone and told me to post the pictures, but when I got onto the website it now wanted money instead of posting ads for free. Will unhappily ran to put money on a card, but when I tried to put the card in it wouldn't accept it, saying it wanted Bitcoin. I informed Will and even showed him. It wasn't going to post, and he became furious, yelled at me before he turned and walked out of the room. I looked at everyone else and tried to apologize for his actions and told them to stay calm, reassuring them that it would be okay. But he came right back in, and he had a gun in his hand. I didn't even know he owned a gun. He hit me in the face with it and said I needed to find somewhere to post the ad. Do it or I'm done, he said. Then he left. I don't know if he'd realized he'd done all that in front of three other girls, and I didn't know what I'm done actually meant. I was absolutely terrified, and that's when I knew I had to find a way to escape. I learned very quickly that I wasn't able to just leave any time I wanted anymore. After Amy had gotten involved, Will changed, and started talking about taking us girls to New York to make big money, traveling here and there, and that alone scared the hell out of me. I wanted to build a life to get my kids back, not to leave state and trick, and maybe get killed or abandoned. It all changed when he hit me with that gun. I've been hit before, punched by a man, but I never been hit with a gun. That night I had a couple of dates set up and Will knew he had to take the girls and leave, so I decided to try to make a plan to get away. On the first date I made $200 put 50 in my purse and then put 50 in a pocket, in a bra that I had hidden away. Then I left the rest on the table. The second date I made $150, put half hidden away and the rest on the table. Then Will came in the door not long after I was finished, grabbed the money off the table, and my purse was sitting right there. I didn't see him do it, but he took the money out of my purse and said he had to just do something, then left again, and that was when I made my escape. I made a hundred calls before I finally reached someone who was willing to help me, and he had a friend come and pick me up and bring me to his house. I will never forget the feeling I had when I was running out to the car with a trash bag full of the stuff I had collected in the past three weeks. I was scared to death that he would come pulling up and see me, and that feeling didn't leave me until we hit the highway. Now I wanted to tell this story because I've never been able to get through telling it. I couldn't help thinking about where I would be, if I'd stayed, and if I would even be alive. It was a warm summer day over the weekend, and my brother, sister and I decided to go to the park with our two best friends. The park was close to where we lived in an isolated area surrounded by woods, and parents would sit on the picnic tables not too far from the playground whilst they watched their kids play. So we met our friends there and played at the playground. Then we started a game of tag with some of the other kids that were also there. While everyone else was at the playground, my friend and I wanted to go exploring in the woods. We didn't ask our parents at first because we thought it would be okay. So we started our hike and discovered a stream. Now my friend and I loved science, rocks and minerals specifically, so we started searching for some cool ones. We continued exploring until we thought we'd heard some leaves crunching. Maybe it was someone walking here too. But ultimately we thought it was just an animal, so we looked around but didn't see anything or anyone so we continued on our exploration. As we made it farther into the woods, I suddenly got an uncomfortable feeling that someone was watching us, so I asked my friend if we could go back to the playground. She said sure because our parents would worry if they couldn't see us anyway, so we made our way back and continued playing at the park. As we were swinging on the swings, we saw a little boy wander off into the woods to explore like we had 
and we also noticed a car parked on the other side of the woods. A guy came out from behind a tree and closer to the little boy. It looked like the guy was trying to lure the boy to come with him. The little boy did begin to go with him. Then the guy tried to grab him. But just then, thankfully, his parents noticed and called for him to come back. At which point the creepy guy took off running into the woods, driving away quickly. One of the parents had gotten a picture of him. My friend and I were really freaked out because we'd been in the exact same spot as the guy had been. He could have been hiding behind a tree, watching us the whole time, and taken off with one of us. Thank goodness we were both okay, and one of the parents had noticed and saved the boy from being kidnapped. After that, my family and friends all went home, and we decided never to go back to that park ever again. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my video. And if you did, could you please give me virtual hugs by subscribing and clicking that notifications button. I also have a Patreon page and YouTube channel membership if you'd like to support me further. Thank you again for being here. Keep being creepy.